So thank you to have joined my, my session, uh, the first session after the keynote. I, I, um, I hope you, you enjoyed the, the keynote. And for me, it's my first KubeCon as an attendee, and of course, in my first KubeCon as a, as a speaker. So a few words about me. So my name is Benoit Musso. I'm French. I'm living in Paris. And I started my career as a developer in C, C++, and Java. And then I moved as uh, an architect and consultant doing performance around App Server in G2E. The last 10 decades, I spent them into the DevOps world and in detail in the continuous integration and continuous delivery subsystem uh, in a company called Xibia Labs. In this company, we add a solution uh, that helps the company to perform deployment automation and release automation. For one year now, I've joined VMware, uh, Tom's team, as a senior solution engineer to help our customers to deploy, update, and write the application using container and the cloud. And we promote solution on the infrastructure side, of course, uh, coming from VMware with a solution co called Tanzu Kubernetes for Operators, and also on the dev side for the application, uh, Tanzu application platform to turn your containers into a platform as a service. Before jumping into the session, I just want to quote me uh, with the reality. If the developer only push a code on the Git repo, it's useless. Because at the end, the target is the production. And nothing else is OK with the production for an application. Else it's just to do IT for IT. So the persona. We have four personas in presentation. The two first are very well known, the dev and the ops. So the dev uh, is writing the application and commits some code to, with a new idea to manage the business. And the ops is running the application on the different environments. And in between, now for a few years, we have two more personas. The first one is the app ops well known as the DevOps, but I prefer to call it AppOS because it's more on the dev side to help the dev team to integrate and deploy the application and managing the framework and what we call the software factory. And on the other side, we have the SRE coming from the Google uh, world, the site reliability engineer that help ops team to manage the run of the application. So in fact, we have four personnel now in the story. And the story is the, the following. We want to um, deploy application in production. So in the large company or even in small company, you have blue application, you have yellow application, and sometimes you have a red application uh, running for only on Golang while you have blue application running on Java. And the target is really the production environment. But before getting in the production environment, you need to promote your application into several environments to do some tests. So typically here we have four environments, but it could be three, it could be 12, depending on your organization and the complexity of your application. And the operation between two environments is to promote the application between one environment and to another one. And before doing that, we need to integrate. The integration phase is, in fact, um, a process that will turn your state or code, in fact, a commit or a branch or a tag, into a set of deliverable item or versionable item. So in the legacy world, it was .exe file, DLL file, Java file, uh, jar file. And now in the container world is the container image. And this artifact will be pushed into maybe a um, so file system, but it could be now into repository such artifactory or image registry. But on the other side of the binary, we have also the configuration. So it could be only simple Java application with a, a dot .property file uh, configuration. But now we have tons of jam, uh, YAML, JSON, and other language to help to configure your application, because now you manage not only the application part, but also the infrastructure part. It's not new. All this process has been de uh, described in two famous books, Continuous Integration and Continuous Delivery. And if the Continuous Integration is now a well-known uh, phase in the company that uh, uh, mainly a legacy phase, uh, the Continuous Deployment and Continuous Delivery is still an issue. And cloud-native applications uh, offer some solutions but bring new issues. So now, if we want to look at the 
CI/CD process. So CI/CD for a global process is coming to go from source to production. And your process is naturally split into small tasks. And your global process is to, for example, to watch my report, to build an image, to perform some tests, to generate a configuration, and to deploy my image. And in the mind of everybody, the process is like this. One task, one other task, and the other. But in fact, in middle, we have what we call an orchestration tool, an orchestrator. And in fact, the relationship between the tasks are not directly behind the, uh, between the tasks, but only between the task and the orchestrator. The orchestrator triggers something, wait for the end, and uh, wait uh, and trigger another one, maybe can do, perform some operation in between. So, of course, this is what we call a natural design. An operating system is based on this process to divide some tasks into smaller tasks. But we have also uh, the ability in this process to have a unique point to monitor, to watch, and to control. Because everything is centralized. But the drawback is the impact of the modification. Each time you need to modify the process by adding a new kind of task, for example, you need to have something on the orchestrator task side, but not on the process side. Also, we have at the end very tightly coupled tasks. That means it's very complicated to create a task you can reuse or you can substitute from another process. So at the end, it's a melting between all the tasks and it's complicated to have or to switch one task for another. Or also, as if everything is centralized, it's become a single point of failure. Uh, of course, from the runtime point of view, in terms of resources, storage, and network, but also from the um, uh, organizational point of view, because only a few, t a few people in the team, typically the software factory or the ops team, only manage this one. And it's complicated to have uh, another team that can manage it. And at the end, it's rigid. That thing, the process has been designed from the left to right to the beginning of the end. And often, it's complicated to trigger some task in parallel or trigger the process in the middle. For example, if you want to rebuild something, sometimes you need to trigger an artificial, an artificial commit into your repo in order to trigger your process. So. It is for one process. And at scale, we have more or less the same problem, of course. Huh? We can have a uh, team using Golang, another is doing Python, and the other is using Java. And the process is only set up often at during sprint zero with building block provided by the software pack, uh, factory team without any update. And at the end, you have a different path to production between different languages. It's complicated to have something you can reuse between the different projects. And often, in, in a large organization, I know uh, this process is only managed by the dev team, and it's complicated to have someone external from the team that can add some ideas to improve the process. But it's not new huh, because all the projects, all the tools uh, doing CI CD from the first one called Cruise Control to the latest one called, for example, GitHub Action or Tecton, are based on this concept. So it's not new, but maybe we can improve. Now, this process is called the orchestration pattern because, in fact, we can mimic an, an orchestra where Every musician knows how to play music, but needs to wait the order for the chief to start to play music and to stop playing music. So it works. Maybe you can do something else. The other point of view is to see this process as a choreography. So in a dance team, in the choreographic team, when the music starts to play, every dancer knows how to do. And maybe one dancer can flow, can fail, can fall, and uh, the global process can be autonomous and can continue to, to run without someone that can tell you need to start over or not. This is the main difference between the orchestration and choreography. So if we try to apply this pattern, we will have some resources, and this resource will have input x and maybe produce output x. And you can have also input y with uh, output y. But also you can have a resource that will trigger new events based on the time, be based on the event, maybe every hour or every day. So it is for a single resource. 
maybe we can have someone that can help another resource to watch the output of the resource A, and maybe to create and to inject the input of the resource A into the input of a uh, resource B. So, for example, to have uh, the output of X going into uh, input of W. And you need to have a component that brings the two all together. This vision also can be uh, like an electronic board. That means it's typical the pattern where we are doing electronics, where you plug the output of one component as an input and another one, and often you can mix to have something very clever. But in the CI-CD process, this process, this option, this new solution is the cartographer project. So the cartographer Cartographer project is, is, is already a CNCF project, so everybody knows this landscape, and we will focus only on the continuous delivery subsystem with two famous projects called Argo CD and Flux CD. And if you were there yesterday at the GitOps code, we talk about a lot about these two projects. But now we have new new project called Cartographer and already uh, involved into the CNCF, uh, but it's a very young project because it's only eight months old, but very active and backed by VMware. So now we try, we, I will try to explain you how, how we can mimic the, uh, the choreography into the CI-CD process. So we have our chore uh, um, orchestration. I want to remove this one, and I want just to keep the task like this. And in fact, the first thing I want to do is to encapsulate all the tasks, to only focus on, to, on the input and the output. That means, in fact, I have no more blue task or orange task and uh, red task. I just have green task and only focus on the input and the output. And what I want to do now, this output will be all connected together. That means, instead to have a process, in fact, that are going from left to right, we will have a process that are going from right to left, in fact, react from the, uh, the output of the other one. So, in fact, the build image will react on the output of the watch repo. The test will react only if I have a new image. This process will be gathered into a concept called a blueprint to be uh, easier shareable and create a description. And this is what we call a blueprint in choreographer, uh, cartographer controller. This controller can be deployed on any Kubernetes confirmant cluster. That means you don't need to have a Tanzu uh, cluster. You can use your AKS, EKS, or whatever distribution it, it will run. So this process, this blueprint, are not owned, are owned by the SRE and app ops. In fact, they have the knowledge to bring the application, how to integrate the application, how to deploy the application. And on the other side, we will have the dev that will, in fact, create and asking for a new workload. So the dev will specify, I want a workload to integrate my uh, Java service, or I want to integrate my uh, Golang uh, AI uh, database service. And based on the specification, the cartographer controller will create an indirection and find out what, what will be the right blueprint to instantiate to manage the integration phase. On the other side, the ops will describe a delivery, and using the same process, the cartographer controller will find out what will be the, um, the blueprint to be instantiated. And in fact, it's very important to have this separation. In fact, you have someone that wants to run it, and you want to, and other personnel that want to deliver it. So as a dev, I need to integrate my code. And as an app ops, I offer dev people a supply chain as a service on the shelf. On the other side, as an ops, I want to deploy my application. And as an SRE, I offer ops people a way to deploy their application across different clusters. And you have a way to hide the complexity and to have a, a separation of con concern between the consumer and the producer. But it's time, and we are at KubeCom, so it's time to have some YAML. So we have here the description of the workload. And the workload is the description to do an integration phase. So we, you will have a resource, so Cartographer brings a new set of CRD, and the first one is the workload, in which the user will specify the workload. So you can see it, it don't specify exactly a name, but provide labels, and based on these labels, or, or based on the properties, the Cartographer controller will instantiate the right blueprint. 
he can provide also parameters about the, um, the Git repo and some parameters to configure my ser the services. For example, if I want, uh, if I need a DB or not uh, to be included into my database, into my service. So if I have a new workload. I, I am in this situation, so I submit my new workload and based on the specification in my workload and what I have in my catalog, based on the permission of course, Cartographer will instantiate the blueprint and by this will in create new resources based on the template described in the blueprint. So in fact, you have something like this, that means associated to my workload, I will have a set of resources tied to the life cycle of the workload. So the resources are not tied to the cartographer controller, are not tied to the blueprint, but really tied to the workload. That means if I change my workload, the resource can be changed. If I delete my workload, all the resource will be deleted. So we have a relationship like this. So at the end, what's a deployment? A deployment, in fact, is a combination of three repositories managed by four personas. Uh, we can have the dev managing the application configuration. We have the uh, ops team or ops persona managing the environment configuration as a declarative desired de de state. And we have deployment rules in a repository uh, called deployment configuration uh, managed by uh, DevOps, App Ops, and Software Factory and SRE. If I split this repo into a CI CD process, we will have the dev people will commit some code and through a CI process will create new item into the application configuration and new item into the image registry. On the other side, uh, the ops team will want to run the application, maybe describe the environment, and all this uh, repository will be mixed all together to create new deliveries that will pull all this information in order to deploy this application. This is what we call a GitOps pull mode. So this pull mode is really what we call a level three or four, I don't remember exactly, a very high level of security consistency in which you are able to safely deploy your application and maybe to scale your cluster, replicate your cluster, either for high availability or for a test or replication of bug. So now if we zoom the CI process, we will have, in fact, uh, I want to move from dev to uh, application repo and uh, image registry, and my uh, supply chain will be a combination of four resources. The first one is coming from Flux CD, because in the Cartographer project, we promote to reuse a set of existing CNCF components. So uh, Git, uh, Git repo Flux CD will watch the repo. As soon as I have a new commit, it will trigger a build pack pack image in order to build an image. So this project is based on the cloud native build pack that helps the, um, any users to build reliable uh, Docker image. And this image will be Docker pushed to my image registry. Then we have the generation of my configuration that will be automatically commit into my application configuration using uh, Tekton. So in, uh, in detail, what's happened? So I have my Git repo uh, there uh, with uh, all my parameters. So it's a standard re uh, Kubernetes resource with a specification and the status. As soon as I have a new commit, my status output change with a new repo indicating I have a new commit watching my repo. On the other side, I have my image that need to have this value. And in fact, the role of cartographer is, is to create a link between the two resources. In fact, the cartographer will propagate the modification of the output to as an input to the other one. So in fact, the role of cartographer is to do a kind of kubectl edit of an item for a given resources managed by cartographer. So in fact, cartographer is kind of wire between two resources and it's only its role. So uh, it's not, it's typically not a spoof because it tries only to promote value and else all the resource will work as alone. So as we have in action, I have my specific of my uh, workload. And when I apply my delivery, uh, my cluster supply chain, you can see based on the workload bird, a set of resources themselves can be, can generate other resources. So an image generate a new pod to create my image. Uh, I have a runnable that will run a task, task on, a tecton uh, task run to create my new commit. So you, you can see all the resources are uh, tied to my workload. So 
what, what kind of information I want to commit. So this information I manage by the dev side, and we can imagine uh, having the kind of structure. So it could be a file system or a Git repo with an uh, application folder. And between this application folder, I have two applications called loader and micropets. And below micropets, you have a version. I use a timestamp to create a version. I can have also a current version. So in fact, when I commit something in the as an output of my integration phase, I want only to commit this value. And what we have inside this value, we don't have kube, uh, Kubernetes resource, but we have only the things managed by the dev side. O of course, we have the commit of the, um, of the new image, and we have the name of the application, the name of the service, and some parameters. Of course, below, we have the link between my HMS registry. On the other side, we have the ops team that can describe and manage all the environment. So it could be prod environment, non-prod environment, UAT environment. And we can have the following structure where I can have split here in my sample uh, environment per uh, hyperscaler. So I have environment on AWS, on Azure, and on vSphere, and below the name of my environment. Using the same principle, I have environment value file, and in this environment value file, I have specification and value managed by the ops people. Typically, I can put the name of an environment. I could specify what kind of ingress I want to use. Is it Contour or Istio, for example, and which will be the uh, exposed public DNS and the internal DNS. So typically, this is managed by the ops people, and you have a set of environment. And in between, we need to have rules. And these rules uh, can be described like this. So it's a set of um, a set of levels. Uh, we can look at as a service level. So we, based on the information provided by the apps and the dev and the op, we will generate standard Kubernetes uh, resource. Could be uh, Kubernetes deployment, config mac, secret, service, ingress, and so on. But maybe I want to try to deploy my application using Knative, and I can have uh, an order that could be K service. So instead to generate resources, Kubernetes resources, but generate only Knative uh, service. I have also imagined a non-service that only replace value if I have only just simple thing you want to deploy and only to deploy value in it. So in this case, of course, the generation of the uh, resource will be uh, directly Kubernetes uh, resources. So we have something like this where the SRE and the apps ops will have a way to generate using uh, here in my example, um, a language called YTT. Now, this YTT is coming from uh, a project uh, backed also by uh, VMware called Carvel. And Carvel offers, in fact, a set of tools with a philosophy with one tool, one feature. That is not the tool that is doing all the things. Of course, at the end, it's performing, templating, generating, and deploying, but try to have some specific tool doing one one thing. For example, one tool to only sign an image, create a unique reference. So Carvel is a very interesting project. And in this project, we have two interesting uh, tools. The first one is, is called YTT. So YTT uh, stands for YAML Template Tool. So only process YAML. So not only provide a way to replace value in it, but also to create some overlay. And if you are a bit of dev guys uh, using Pythonish code, you can also generate some code and write some code to help you to generate some code. And it is very interesting because you can use it for any YAML tool. So it can be used, of course, for Kubernetes, but also for CloudFormation, for Azure, Azure uh, Cloud, uh, something, I don't remember the name. So anything you have YAML, you can use it. Uh, even with Elm, you can use the output of Elm to patch some value not uh, managed by Elm. Then we have also a way to deploy an application with another CLI tool. You can download and uh, use it right now called CAP, K-App. K-App can, can replace uh, uh, kubectl for deployment. It, it does two things. The first thing is to gather a set of resources under a name, could be application name, service name, component name. So in which it will stamp all the resources you deploy uh, with a name, and it will control all these resources as the same life cycle. So it's avoid to have someone that can patch your resource with another deployment and to be sure everything is under control. Other features, it is a synchronous 
tool. That means you know all, if you are here, when you are doing kubectl apply, in fact, it's just to apply and to request Kubernetes cluster to apply this configuration. In which with CAP, not only CAP applies the configuration, but also check if everything is up and running locally. That means check if my pod has been started, if my ingress is correctly created, and so on. So we have a checklist, and at the end, you have a clear state if it is deployed or not. So it's very interesting. So you can use it right now on your Kubernetes cluster, but <coughs> In your sample, we will use the server side of this project with a component called KApp Controller that will, in fact, mix between YTT and KApp server side. In fact, you will have a resource described like this where you can specify a set of repository where you want to fetch information. You can specify the way to deploy uh, if you want to uh, do it synchronously, allow upgrade or share resources. And at the end, the state of the resource will reflect your deployment. And for the deployment phase, we will use also another resource uh, called smoke test. It's not because you have all your resource that updated and deployed at the Kubernetes level, that means all together is OK. Uh, everybody has already has a, a to troubleshoot to connect your ingress to your service, to your pod, to your config map, to your volume. So at the end, it's not because all your components are deployed Everything is okay. So I have a personal side project called a smoke test operator that provides a way to trigger a smoke test to validate if I can trigger something from the beginning and the end. So to have something to call a dedicated AP call or the main web page on my web app in order to check everything is correct. So now if we want to create a um, choreography of all this, in fact, we will have a delivery that will specify several Git repositories that will watch the deployment rules, the application configuration, and the environment configuration. And as soon as you have one of these items that be modified, the output of the Git repo will be moved and will be injected into the cap controller. That means, in fact, you are really the output of each Git repo injected into my cap controller. The cap controller resource will wait for the deployment. And if it's OK, we'll modify the, um, the smoke test in order to trigger the validation. Everything is under control. So as soon as the same pattern we have with, with workload, we have the same with deliverable. So we provide a name, label. I want to have my delivery using smoke test. Uh, it's a request from uh, the, uh, the ops. You can imagine to deliver some project without smoke test because it's not implemented, and other uh, with smoke test because it's uh, by design in the in the service. We provide the parameters, and the parameter has only two: the name of my application and the version, of course, and the environment. So from the ops people, it's only to deploy a version of my application onto my environment, and of course, I can provide a link to my um, deployment rules. Maybe I want to test some deployment rules for prod and not exactly the same for pre-prod because I do some tests and maybe I migrate for Kubernetes 124 to 125 uh, in the next month. So in action, what we have, uh, ah, you are like this. So using the same pattern we had for uh, workload, we create a new resource and the cartographer controller generate and instantiate the associated resource. And you can see there for my uh, deliverable dogs, I will have app dogs, three git repo, and a smoke test. And the smoke test trigger a job that trigger a pod. And you can see everything is under control and using the same life cycle than the uh, deliverable. Nothing uh, uh, managed directly by uh, at the runtime by the cartographer. So if we want to wrap up uh, this presentation, so choreography with Cartographer is really a new way to doing CI-CD, and uh, what I prefer to say, an opinionated way to do CI-CD. Maybe it's not something really new, but it's worth to have something new to have in mind, maybe to improve our current process. And it's always good to have side projects and other projects to uh, try to make have a new mind of uh, our current delivery.
Also, he offers really um, hide, or to hide the complexity because you have really a separation of concern between the ops team, what we and the dev team and the app ops and the SRE, with the same way to instantiate. It's very important to have the same contract. In fact, whatever you are doing, deploying Go, integrating uh, .NET Core or Java, the contract is always to create a new workload or create a new deliverable and based on the specification, based on this. Uh, resources, a new blueprint will be instantiated or upgraded depending on the need. Maybe you can have an update provided by the SRE in case of deployment. We want to add a security check before deploying and automatically can be automatically managed by the, by the team without asking the ops team to redeploy something or to trigger a modification on their side. If you are a bit curious, we have here the um, cartographer.sh. Uh, website on the left, and if you are really, really curious, you have the source code written on Go, of course. Here you have the list of all the resources I used during this presentation. Uh, I didn't have the opportunity to do it live, but we can have a discussion, and it, it works, it uh, up and running. And if you are uh, don't, if you don't have any distribution now, you can use what we call now the VMware Community Edition, in which VMware provides a set of components, including uh, Cartographer and other, other, and including also a Kubernetes distribution. And with the new announcement at the DockerCon, now you can create in one click using your, your Docker Dev a new cluster using uh, Tantu Community Edition, and you have already the way with a set of packages on the right, all the components to not only deploy Cartographer, but also to deploy all the needed package, for example, KPAC, uh, Carvel Tools, uh, and, and Tecton. So it's ready to be deployed and ready to be used. If you don't want to use uh, Tanzu Community, Community Edition Kubernetes, you can apply the same package on your uh, AKS or uh, your own cluster. Merci. Uh, if you have any question, feel free to ask. You have a microphone in the middle, I think. Uh, or else I will be uh, outside uh, of the room. There's one from the online. Yeah. What are the differences between Carvel and Helm? Uh, uh, what's the difference between Carvel and Helm? In fact, we are more or less on the same level. In fact, it, it, we can see them as a competitor. You can use, for example, uh, YTT with Helm. Typically, you have an Helm chart and you want to modify a parameter you can't modify with Helm because it's not in the, in the value. You can, using Helm generate, pipe using YTT, pipe using kubectl to deploy your Helm chart and to configure. And if you don't like Helm to deploy, you can re re replace the whole uh, tool chain by KApp. 